going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible and you are at our Sweetwater campus, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, then there is a table situated right at the uh, back of the room in the middle. And just you go right now and grab one of those Bibles. Any place you are, grab one. Turn to page 1,131. Page 1,131, you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're in any of our campuses and you want a Bible, you need a Bible, please take one of our Bibles. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, message us. We'll be glad to get you a Bible. We want you to have God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, speaking of life change, uh, this morning we met for our annual business meeting. We approved all the normal stuff, but we also decided it's time to uh, talk about expansion. So we voted to do that, and you'll be hearing more about that. We're going to be altering our Sweetwater campus. Uh, We're going to be adding a balcony in here uh, so we've got more seats. uh, And I know right now there's plenty of seats. It's the first weekend in June. But... uh, but we'll need them more as the winters come. And of course, our building in Parker is a near, as I would say it's nearing completion, not soon enough. But uh, we hope to have that done in the fall. And I hope you're looking forward to that because I know that the setup and takedown week after week after week has become tiresome for y'all. So you have hope looking forward to it. And we're praying about the great things God's going to do in Parker when the new building is open. Uh, And then, of course, tomorrow uh, is the Lake Baptisms. Today, if you're in Parker, it's the Lake Baptism, 6 o'clock down at uh, the London Bridge Beach. And so I hope you'll join us, whether you're declaring your faith in Christ or whether you want to celebrate those who do. And, And as Pastor Robert mentioned, if you have not yet declared your faith publicly in Christ and you know you're a follower of Jesus then uh, what are you waiting for? Show up tomorrow and uh, show up Saturday or Sunday at six at the Lennon Bridge Beach and you will celebrate with you the, your declaration of faith. Hey, uh, do you remember the, the good old days? Good old days, you know? You ever think about those good old days? Look back with, with fond memories about the good old days. Now we tend to idolize them. Uh, You know, we look back and pretend it was way better than the world we live in now, right? And we get all excited about the good old days. Oh, remember when? The good old days. And and the problem with remembering the good old days is we remember the best parts, but we forget about the other stuff. Uh, Because was it really better in the good old days? I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, I grew up in some pretty small houses with two or three bedrooms and one bath. I don't want to go back to that. In the 1960s, you realize that the average house was like a three-bedroom, one-bath with 900 square feet. Some of you, I won't say have garages bigger than that because you have garages bigger than like the good houses now. But uh, you got casitas bigger than that, okay? Some of you do. Um, Or how about this? Do you remember that most cars back in the day didn't have air conditioning? Right? And then how about manual windows? I know, there's... Those of you under 40, I'm not sure you ever experienced the joy of this. Especially when you had one of those ones that was sticky, you know, and you're like, oh, golly, got to roll it down because it's hot in this car. Or how about uh, such joys like, you know, gas lines and rationing, Vietnam, and uh, just one word for the 70s, disco. You really want to argue that the good old days were better? Um, You know, in the good old days, drunk driving was normal. Seatbelts were optional. And there was this disgusting thing called a 55-mile-an-hour national speed limit. I rejoice the day that that expired. Uh, I just want you to know that. There were also no cell phones, no streaming. And how many people had a TV that would be considered small today that had three or four channels and you had to get up and change them? Okay, does anybody miss those days? I mean, come on. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, everybody who thinks about the good old days wants to qualify what they could have and what they would like to keep from today. So maybe the good old days weren't so great. You know, the same thing happens with churches. 
We look back and idolize the past. And when a church actually idolizes their own past and thinks back about all the great things that they've done and stuff, instead of looking forward, they tend to die. But most churches tend to look back uh, and kind of idolize the days of the New Testament church. And they like to go, oh, the New Testament church, that's what we want to be like. We want to be like the New Testament church. Because the New Testament church didn't have any problems and all, it was filled with saintly martyrs who were always happy to suffer for Jesus. Problem is, the good old days weren't so ideal. And you actually discover that if you have the audacity to read the Bible. We kind of encourage that here. Uh, and so today, as we're beginning a series on 1 Corinthians, it's the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that he started. Uh, the story of that's in Acts chapter 18, if you want to read that. Uh, he stayed there 18 months. He visited them once more before he was imprisoned. And we don't know if he got back another time. He wanted to, but we don't know if he got there. Uh, but he was there at least twice. He spent 18 months as pastor of this church, as the missionary pastor of this church, starting the church. And, and basically, he writes a letter to them. He wrote two letters to them. That's why it's 1 Corinthians. But his first letter is uh, basically a message to a messed up church. I mean, it's, uh, it includes teaching, correction, encouragement, and flat out rebuke. I mean, he is a parent scolding his children in many ways. They had issues. I mean, they were real people with real problems. And since Calvary is a real church with real people who have real problems, there's a lot we can learn from our uh, you know, brothers and sisters who occupied uh, the church in Corinth, uh, if you will, our dysfunctional relatives from that church. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First 17 verses, some of it is just greeting and, and uh, saying hi and, and blessing them and things like that, since we just sang about blessings. So the apostle starts off by identifying himself. He says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now let me just pause right there because he's talking to us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, you made this commitment to follow Jesus, then you're one of these people. Did you catch that? called to, the, to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this letter is not only to the church in Corinth, it's to you. And it's to me as followers of Christ. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, by the way, we want you to become one, but uh, you can listen in because if you become a follower of Jesus, then these words are directed to you. Otherwise, you just listen in and see what God expects of us, his followers. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus. God is faithful, by whom you were called, into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Beautiful beginning, isn't it? Nice introduction. This is for us as followers of Jesus. I want blessings. You've been gifted by God. God is faithful. Nine whole verses before he gets to the first rebuke. Nine entire verses, and then he gets there. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, he had spies, been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, well, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ because we're better than you. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. 
Oh, so that no one may say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cry, cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Uh, before we dive into this, let me just tell you how your pastors are like the Apostle Paul. We don't always remember who we baptized. Can, can I just be really honest? I've been pastor of Calvary for 31 years. We as a church have baptized over 3,000 people during that time, and I baptized a bunch of you, and I don't always remember exactly who. So, and, and not just me, but the other pastors as well. Uh, pastor Mitch was talking about, he just, he's been here five years. He's baptized like 25 times the number of people he baptized prior to coming here in all of his 10 years of ministry. And, and he's like, I didn't even realize that. It, we just, and I'm just saying, we're like the Apostle Paul because he's like, I don't even remember if I baptized anybody else, and we're that way too. So if you're coming uh, tomorrow to the lake baptism and you're like, oh good, I want Pastor Chad to baptize me so that he always remembers, I want to lower your expectations now. <laughs> just saying. By the way, it doesn't matter who baptizes you. What matters is you declaring your faith in Jesus. Amen. That's what matters. It's not the person doing the dunking. It's the people who believe that matters. So uh, that said, uh, let's talk about this, this passage because the Apostle Paul gets nine verses before he gets to the problems and he strongly declares the need for unity in the church and he denounces divisions and quarreling in the church. And this resonates with me because I grew up in, and, and have served in ministry in fighting churches, including this one in the early days. Okay, we fought over staff. Who should we hire? We fought over money. How much should we pay him? We fought over ministries. What should we do? We fought over money. How much should we spend? We fought over the process of making decisions. We fought over, did I mention money? See, that's usually what churches fight over. And I'm with Paul 100% on the need for unity. So let me ask you this question. What will you fight about? What will you fight about? I mean, the people in Corinth were fighting about who's, uh, you know, who they were following of the early church leaders, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm a disciple of the Apostle Paul. He's the one who's, who shared Christ with me and baptized me. Well, I'm the follower of the Apostle Peter because I read his letter. And I, oh, I'm the follower of Apollos because he's my favorite teacher. And oh, we follow Jesus because we're more spiritual than you. And they were all divided. What are you going to fight about? See, uh, among the people of God, fellow followers of Jesus, what will you allow to divide the church? That's the question. And, and by the way, uh, I want you to think about that all week. I hope you'll wrestle with that all week as we talk through this, uh, this issue. Uh, will you let politics divide the church? So, uh, look, I've been around churches where church, church politics were divisive. And by church politics, I mean where people's tried to, you know, get in with this staff member and get them turned against that staff member. And it's like, oh, we're for the pastor. Oh, we like the executive pastor. Uh, I'm, I'm Pastor Pete. Oh, no, I'm for Pastor Robert. Oh, no, I'm for Pastor Jesse. He's my favorite. Oh, no, Pastor Chad. He's been here for... No, and see, and, and I've been in churches where people actually formed camps around pastors and, and the church fought each other. Can I just tell you that your, your senior team, your pastoral team is united in what we're doing? We're united in the mission. Or will you allow political politics to divide the church? See, will you allow your political beliefs to separate you from your spiritual family? Look, I've got political opinions. I care about our country. But I'm not going to allow those to divide us. Uh, and you have to wrestle with this idea. Is your identity with Jesus or is it with an elephant or a donkey? I'd throw in something for libertarians, but I don't know what animal they attach to, you know. The, uh, I had a, had a gentleman early in the life of Calvary in a meeting, a public meeting, where we were talking about, uh, you know, church stuff, probably a business meeting like we had this morning. And, uh, and he actually had the audacity to stand up in the meeting and say, I don't believe that anybody can be a Christian and vote Democrat. Now, he said that in the meeting, and I said, well, uh, that may be your personal belief, but it's not biblical. He said, well, I just don't believe, and I said, it's not biblical. 
Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's what the Bible says. He says, well, I don't think, and he said it again. And I said, well, the apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It doesn't say anything about how you vote. Guess what? When Paul wrote this, nobody got a vote. Period. That doesn't qualify or disqualify. Last election, I heard people say, you can't be a Christian and vote for Donald Trump. And, and, uh, and I went, oh, look, it goes both sides. People are just all accusing each other of, well, you can't believe in Jesus and vote this way. That's not one of the qualifiers, by the way, people. You know what the qualifier is? Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I'm trusting him to save me. Amen. Okay, that's what unites us. Are we willing to let politics divide us and the body of Jesus? You have to wrestle with that question. So will you allow politics to be what divides us? Will you fight for politics? Or will you fight for preferences? Will you let your personal likes or dislikes divide the body of Christ? I mean, we all have preferences. And I've seen churches fight over every single one of them. Preferences about music, about what kind of music we should sing, about how loud the music should be. Uh, preferences about decor. What should the church look like? What color should the carpet be? We don't have carpet for that reason. Okay? What time should the service be? What should the order of the service be? How should ministries be funded? How should they run? Who's making the decisions? All this kind of stuff. And the question is, will we value our preferences over the unity of the people of God? And just so you know where, where I stand on this, um, nobody's preferences are more important than the mission of Christ. When I say that, I mean nobody. And, I, and I'll, this, this is a conversation that happened probably five years ago. Uh, we were new into Sweetwater and things were going well. And one day in a Saturday night service as, uh, uh, as the music was playing, it might've been a rehearsal or whatever, uh, my wife, who we've been married 39 years now, uh, she, she leaned over to me and she goes, I miss some of the old songs. We should sing some of the old songs. She was talking about the old modern songs, songs we sang 10 years ago. And she goes, and, and they should turn it down just a little bit. And I said, we're not gonna do either one. And she said, why not? I said, because we're not trying to reach 55-year-old Christian women. <laughs> now, you guys are laughing. She was not. And I didn't say it as a joke. I said it because, it, look, I'm just going to tell you, if my wife doesn't get her preferences, you ain't getting yours. Okay, that's how, that's how serious I am about the mission of Christ, taking priority over preferences, because I've watched churches demolish themselves, fighting over people's preferences, and the mission is not in the conversation. The mission at Calvary will take precedence. But will you fight about your preferences? Will you fight about power? Who decides? Who decides how to spend the money? Who decides whom to hire? Who decides which ministries we have? Look, I've seen people question and challenge and attack every de single decision that they didn't make. Even if they agreed with it. They didn't make it, so they got to question it. I've also watched them question the people who made the decisions uh, who are volunteers. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm thankful for Calvary and for the leaders of Calvary because we had this great business meeting this morning where we discussed things. We discussed building. We discussed budget. We discussed all that stuff. And, it's, and we're unified. Now, does everybody agree? No, everybody didn't agree. But nobody was accusing others of uh, being unethical or th doing things selfishly or anything like that. They asked realistic questions about priorities and about timelines and about plans and about how things would play out. See, will you fight about politics or preferences or power? Or will you fight about doctrine? Fighting about doctrine seems so holy, doesn't it? Well, are you gonna allow your convictions about scriptural teachings to be a point of division in the body of Christ. Now, yeah, there are some things to fight about. We'll talk about those later, but the church has been debating theology for roughly 1,800 years, and we still don't agree. And, and there are godly people who disagree, who believe in the Bible, who believe in Jesus, who love Jesus, and they still can't agree on what it teaches at certain points. Okay, so the, the question isn't whether we are always going to agree or not. The question is, can you respect people who disagree with you biblically? Or will you divide the church 
over doctrine. So what will you fight about? Personally, I'll fight for the mission of Jesus and basic biblical orthodoxy because divisions distract from the mission and leave us powerless. Divisions will distract us from the mission of Christ and leave us powerless. If we want to fail, if we want to fail in the mission that God gave us and be powerless as the body of Christ, we should fight over politics, over preferences, over power, and even over doctrine instead of listening to Jesus. Because here's what Jesus said, Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If you thought Abraham Lincoln came up with those lines, you were mistaken. He borrowed them from Jesus. A house divided cannot stand. And when a church is engulfed in divisive conflict, it makes them powerless and ineffective. It's one of the reasons that so many churches in America are dying. Because we've allowed the fight to be about things that aren't the mission. It's kind of like this. You know why churches die when they start fighting over stupid stuff? It's kind of like if you were to invite people over to your house for dinner when you and your spouse are having a knockdown drag out fight. Have you ever been there with somebody who just was really there mad at each other and you were at dinner and you just felt so, uh, so awkward, you just like wanted to hide? You just wanted to get up and leave? Yeah, you don't want to accept an invitation back to dinner if that's how it happened. Uh, and that's exactly what it's like if you come into a church where the people are angry at each other and there's camps fighting against each other and vying for power. You feel the tension. You, you recognize that things are not well and you don't want to come back. Uh, some of you have friends who, when you were with them, they are always fighting and arguing and you found yourself wanting less and less to hanging out with them. See, when churches have unhealthy conflict, it makes it impossible to accomplish the mission of Christ. Plain and simple. So at Calvary, that's why we say we don't want uniformity. We desire unity in love and mission. We're not looking for uniformity. We don't want to create a bunch of cloned Christians that dress the same, talk the same, act the same, do you know, all everything the same, kind of look a little, a little scary. We don't want to look like a cult, Okay. We're not trying to do that. We're not trying to not clones. What we want are people to live out authentically their faith in Christ in their unique way that God has gifted you, equipped you, and and the experiences that you have had. That's what we want. I don't expect everyone to agree with me on every doctrine in Scripture. I don't even expect all the pastors on staff to agree with me on all the doctrines in Scripture. Now, we clearly explain our five essential doctrines in the intro to Calvary class. If you have not taken the intro class, the next one is scheduled to be offered at the end of August. Put it on your calendar, plan to come, and learn more about Calvary and who we are. But here's the five essential doctrines of Calvary. You can find them on our website if uh, you can't write this fast. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. Okay? We are biblical people. We're not going to give any ground on that. We're not going to compromise on that. We believe the Bible. We're going to read it and apply it because we believe God will change your life if you do that. We believe there is one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, every Orthodox Christian church believes that. Everyone. We believe that Jesus came in the flesh, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Okay? That's, look, that's why Jesus is the Savior. We believe what the Bible actually teaches about him. We believe that all people are sinners and need the grace of God. I don't think we've ever been unclear about that, have we? You know? We, we all need God's grace. And then finally, the fifth one is salvation is only through faith in Jesus. There are no other ways to get to heaven. There are no other passes given to people. It is Jesus and Jesus only. His name is the only one given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. And so that's why we do missions. And that's why we encourage you to invite your friends. And that's why I encourage you to tell the story of how God has changed your life. Because people need Jesus. Now those are the doctrines that we'll fight over. That's it. That's it. 
They define basic biblical orthodoxy. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but God's called me to be the pastor of Calvary, so I get to teach my specific, my personal interpretations of Scripture. Uh, all of them are orthodox. They fall in different camps, depending on how you define the camps of theological beliefs and stuff like that. All of them are biblical, and I trust uh, that you don't have to agree with my interpretations. I want you to read Scripture. I want you to figure it out. I want God to teach you, and, uh, and I'll respect your views as long as you respect mine. That's how this works. So we don't expect uniformity, but we do expect and we champion unity in love and in mission. Unity in love and in mission. These are so significant. First of all, we expect unity in love. Why love? Because Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's it. Okay? Now, we also tend to believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. So since Jesus said the great commandment is to love God and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, then we believe that you can't really represent Jesus if you're not loving people. Now, I've been in a lot of churches where they said, oh, we love people. Really, because love is patient and love is kind. Now, there's a whole lot more descriptors, descriptors in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll get to those in a couple months. But, um, but here's the thing. If you're not being patient, you're not being kind, you're not being loving, you're failing. That's it. That, I mean, that's why this is so significant. We expect unity in love. Unity in love means we love Jesus and we love each other and we actually act like we love each other. So unity in love and unity in mission. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope you know that by now. If you're new, we don't expect you to know it, but if you've been here any length of time, that's our mission. That's why we do what we do. This is the, the reason the way the church is structured as it is. This is the priority. This is what we're focused on. Okay, it's what drives us. And, and if you're like, well, I don't agree with that mission, then there are other churches in town because we're not changing that. This is what we're focused on. We wanna see people experience that life-changing forgiveness and grace that only Jesus can bring. And, and so here's what happens. If we embrace unity and love and mission, then God shows up in powerful ways. He delights in our unity, and, and, and here's what happens. Unity is powerful and effective, okay? This is the, the end result. When we're unified, it is powerful and effective. When we're united, our house is gonna stand. When we're united, people pay attention. See, they show up for, to our house for dinner, which is what worship is, and they go, oh, these people are nice and we like it. Maybe we'll come back again, whether they're invited or not. See, that, that's how this works. If we're not united, people show up and they go, I don't like this place. These people are mean, they're nasty, they're, they're rude, they're unfriendly, and we're out of here. So people treat the, the guests with respect and kindness because why? Because, well, because we're united in love and mission. So unity is powerful and effective and unity promotes joy and peace. I don't know anybody who's against joy and peace. Okay, maybe there's some anarchists out there. I don't know, but uh, it's difficult to rejoice in the middle of conflict, isn't it? I mean, look, we want good relationships. We want delightful relationships. If you're in the midst of a fight with your spouse, it's not a delightful time. There's not a lot of joy in that. So um, when you fight, it means you don't have peace. I grew up with three brothers, two of them older brothers. But can I just say there wasn't a lot of peace? There was a lot of fighting and a lack of peace. And so I was always frustrated when uh, my girls were young and at home and would argue and be mean to each other. And, and, uh, and I used to always tell them, can't you guys just get along, just get along, just get along. And now that they're adults and parents, they go, oh, we get it. <laughs> we totally get it now. Why can't they just get along? Uh, see, unnecessary conflict kills joy and, and makes us tired. It just makes us tired. Unity allows joy and peace to thrive in our midst. 
And by the way, it makes us appealing to the outside world because unity proclaims Jesus. That's what it does. That's what Jesus said it would do. Uh, in John chapter 17, Gospel of John chapter 17, Jesus prays what is often called the high priestly prayer. It, I just, it's the prayer, it's really the Lord's prayer, because he's in the garden and he's praying, but right before he's arrested, and John, because John's the closest one to him, records this. He hears this, and, and he records it for us, and he says this is what Jesus prayed the night that he was betrayed. Verses 20 and 21. He's already prayed a whole bunch for his disciples. Uh, he says, I do not ask for these only, his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Did you guys believe in Jesus through the word of the disciples? Yeah, you did. Jesus prayed for you and me right before he was crucified. He said, I pray for the, those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Father, make them one so that the world will believe in me, that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the Son of God, that I'm the Savior of the world. You see, the world believes in Jesus through our unity, unity in love, unity in mission. When we're united in love and mission, it gives the gospel credibility to a world that is desperate for hope. Let me say that again. When we're united in love and mission, it gives the gospel credibility. When we fight over selfish or unnecessary issues, then people dismiss us, they dismiss our message, and they dismiss our Savior. That's why Jesus prayed for us to be one. And that's why the Apostle Paul rebukes the Corinthian Christians for their selfish, immature, and divisive attitude. That's why he challenges them to be of the same mind and the same mission of one accord. So my challenge is let's not fight with each other, but let's fight together for the cause of Christ. Let's be one so that we can enjoy the power and the presence of God through the ministry that he's given us. Let's pray. Father, you know how easy it is, how tempting it is to be divisive. We want to get our way. We want our preferences indulged. We we feel so strongly about being right about our convictions, whether they're political or economic or, or, or just how the church should be run. And God, we, we admit that sometimes we put our preferences above the mission of Christ. So we repent. We repent and we ask that you would meet us at this place and you would make us one. Not because we all think exactly alike, not because uh, we look the same or talk the same or even like the same music. But God, make us one in your love and for the cause of Jesus. Because a world is desperate to know him. A world that he died to redeem. A world that he died to rescue. A world that he wants to save. And God, you have chosen us to be your representatives and, and we want to be better at that. So Father, make us one in love, make us one in mission so that your power will rest on us as the people of God in Parker and Lake Havasu. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.